Good morning to everyone. After the intervention of Aaron, it's a little bit difficult to say any meaningful on the stage and it's not to say just the usual, uh, the usual statement when a patient is talking. But I was very much into focusing around what we should have get out of this panel and then while I was looking at my notes, I heard Aaron talking. <laughs> I just stopped. And I was listening to this uh, young boy that was telling his story and it was just, um, just shocking. It took my stomach and it reminded me a little bit why beside the fascination of the science and the love for the business that we do, we actually we are here. I got a promise from the ARM leadership that next time we will open this conference with a patient testimony. I think it's gonna level set us really in the right spirit about why we are all here, 1,700 people for, at the end, doing good. But anyway, let me, let me move out from that, in any case, because uh, we have a notable panel, and uh, I would like to take the next hour to really take the best out of the people we have uh, on the stage today. We are going to focus on uh, pluripotent stem cell this morning. It's probably one of uh, the most interesting field, but before diving into that specifically, I really would like to let each of us introduce itself. As a matter uh, of introduction for myself, my name is Alberto Sant'Agostino. I'm the senior vice president and I'm heading the Synergy Technology Business Unit of Lonza. As you probably know, Lonza is a CDMO, so we take care of everything about development and manufacturing. CMC technical development and manufacturing for any type of drug. Personally, I'm responsible of the modality related to cells and viruses and anything that we call new modalities. It's, um, it's really a privilege to be here. It has been a wonderful couple of days in which finally we reconnected and hopefully we are going to have the opportunity to dive in one of the probably most promising, interesting modalities for the long term. But I would like to introduce Melissa, so a couple of words about yourself. Sure, so I'm Melissa Carpenter, and I'm the CSO of Regenerative Medicine at Elevate Bio. And I've been in the stem cell therapy space for, gosh, over 25 years, um, working on pluripotent stem cells and uh, adult stem cell therapies. And really was in the, at the very beginning of the pluripotent stem cell therapy world, where in 1998, we launched the first ESL programs out of Geron Corporation that was based on the work that Jamie Thompson published in 1998 with the first human embryonic stem cells. So I've seen the space of all for a very long time. And I joined Elevate just about three years ago to build out the regenerative medicine business unit there. And Elevate's ecosystem is such that we have uh, platform technologies like the iPSC therapies that, I've just, that we're talking about, as well as genome editing as well as a whole suite of quality and process development systems, and that all lives inside Basecamp, our GMP facility that has a, a cell therapy facility as well as a gene therapy facility. So it's quite a remarkable place that enables and accelerates a lot of therapeutic technologies. So, and it's great to be here, thank you. Thank you much, Melissa. Yeah. Seth, if you don't mind, a couple of words about yourself and your organization. Sure, sure, so good morning. Uh, Seth Ettenberg, CEO of Blue Rock Therapeutics. Blue Rock is about a five-year-old uh, company, and the basis is in induced pluripotent stem cells. Um, and we spent the first three years of that building the foundation, very similar to what you heard from Melissa, around the curation and uh, quality source material, proprietary reprogramming, all the way through to differentiation process. And as you mentioned, Melissa, we, we too stand on the shoulders of giants at, at Blue Rock. As have, we have three uh, really world-class founders that have given us uh, the, the access to their laboratories and uh, their know-how and have allowed us to launch our first clinical trial, which is in Parkinson's disease, DA01 is the, is the medicine that we call. Um, and it's just been an incredible experience. We are now a wholly owned subsidiary of Bayer Medicine, and that creates a very unique ecosystem and a very unique um, ability to move forward a brand new technology. We can lean on Bayer for their capabilities and their global uh, execution excellence as we move into global trials um, and at the same time we're kept at arm's length and so we make very rapid decisions based on data and staying very close to the data to make those decisions and so I like to describe it as the best of both worlds um, of course you can imagine when you're dealing with a large organization there are days where that's not true 
Um, but I will tell you that for inside the Blue Rock, the culture is what drives us in passion and seeing Aaron earlier, and we've brought in patients as well for Parkinson's disease, it is what gr grounds us and roots us in, in the obstacles that we have ahead. While it is maybe the most interesting field, it also ha tends to be the most complex to bring forward <laughs> as a medicine. Thank you very much, Seth. Osvaldo, but as we are friends, I can call you Lalo. That's right, right. that's right. So a couple of words about yourself and your organization, if you don't mind. Yeah, of course. Good morning, everyone. Lalo Flores, uh, CEO of Century Therapeutics. Um, yeah, I, um, I have a technical background. I've, I've been before Century um, many years uh, as um, a, a R and D leader in big pharma and, and biotech. Um, I, um, after I sold my previous company um, to J and J, I, I um, went to think what, what was next, right? And, and at that time, um, in 2015, 16, you know, we were. 17, uh, were inspired by the data of the early pioneering cell therapies. And, and as a drug developer and entrepreneur, I thought, you know, I want to get into cell therapy. And um, so I joined forces with Versan in 2018 to start Century. And, and our vision was, you know, we, we'd seen, you know, the, you know um, the, the potential of the modality using living uh, cells as drugs. And the question was for us, what else can we do to really move the field forward? dramatically enhance access uh, of, 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 to, uh, of, um, of the therapies. And, and, and the thought was, well, um, let's build a company that would be, have all the ingredients to, to become a leader um, in the development of allogeneics of therapies uh, for cancer. And the decision was to embrace um, stem cells, iPSCs to be specific, as a, a starting cell, as opposed to uh, using donor derived like most others um, uh, in, in the industry are doing. And the simple reason was we wanted to take advantage of the uh, replication capacity of, of iPSCs to uh, perform extensive genetic engineering so we can increase the functionality of immune effector cells. And so the vision was that we um, partnered with FCDI to get the company going, uh, bring some IP, but then we have, um, you know, our study has been to build a fully vertically integrated uh, biotech company with our own gene editing capabilities to, so we can per perform CRISPR-based uh, HDR to incorporate genes uh, in a, in a site-selected fashion, uh, embrace manufacturing, invest um, you know, from, from the beginning right, in process development, analytical develop, development, um, QC, QA, et cetera, so we, so we can really learn how, how to um, uh, manufacture this, this product. So very excited to tell you more about that. And uh, we say it's been a fun journey and I'm um, looking forward to uh, discuss the, where, where we are. Very good, Lalo. Thank you so much. And Xiao Kui, right? uh, Correct. You need to forgive <laughs> me, but uh, it will take me a couple of rounds before we <laughs> to pronounce it right. It's a pleasure to have you on stage. Why don't you say a couple of words about yourself and the company you represent? Sure, thank you. thank you so much for having me here. It's such an honor to be on this panel uh, with other panelists. Uh, my name is Shakri Zan, Chief Scientific Officer of Aspen Neuroscience, um, scientist by training um, in molecular and cellular biology. Spent about uh, 16 years on the R&D side of pursuing cell and gene therapy development, 11 years <coughs> with cell gene cellular therapeutics, and followed by um, cellularity for four years before I joined Aspen last year. So Aspen Neuroscience is an autologous IPSC platform company. We're highly differentiated. The company is built uh, based on the vision uh, by Dr. Jean Loring, who's in the audience. It's such a great pleasure having you there. Um, the company spawned off from Scripps Research Institute four years ago, so we're four years old, still very young company. Um, so the, hi the highly differentiator is that uh, we've built upon the stem cell uh, biology and the AI-focused genomics that established the at scripts, and then we went further and then uh, integrated the two. So right now, uh, the, our lead program is autologous IPSC-derived uh, neuron replacement therapy for Parkinson. Thank you very much, Xiaokui. So just uh, running the risk to being obvious because we have um, a group of scientists and people in the industry here in the room, I just want <coughs> to say, <laughs> Hiya. May I? Yeah, please go on. <laughs> Thank you so much. 
a couple of obvious uh, considerations. I'm also losing my voice, so forgive me. I have lions here that will be generous with me and let, allow me to moderate in any case. A couple of obvious points. Um, PSCs and IPSCs in general are what they call the third wave or the, or the futuristic frontier because they will solve some essential problem. Autologous is the uh, same patient back to the same patient. Allogenic is one donor, a few patients. IPSC will fundamentally solve the paradigm of sourcing drugs. And this will take us in an archetype of manufacturing and providing drugs to the market that is going to be similar to the monoclonal antibodies where we have a cell line and then we are producing as much drug as we need. This is going to change uh, pivotally both the cost point and the quality point because having one single source of the drug allows us level of characterization and level of specificity and control that is unconceivable to be achieved at the autologous level. So if you look at the horizon, this could be probably the solution to many problems, but from a scientific standpoint, this is enormously challenging and is probably a frontier that is more out there. In terms of organization, uh, the PSCs and the IPSCs and in general pluripotent is becoming an increasing focus of investment and an increasing focus of companies, and much of the best talent is getting attracted in those projects and setups. So I have a very high degree of confidence that this is going to be the future, so it's not a question of if, but it's more a question of when, of where the therapeutics are, are gonna go. Um, as, a, as an organization that are represented on the table, I believe we have a polyhedricity of angle to the matter of PSC, so hopefully the conversation is going to be interesting. As Lonza, we have created probably the first IPSC line of the NIH. We have been working into both the science and the manufacturing of those products. But we have companies that are very valuable in their science, in the editing, in the differentiation, and many of those aspects. We will try our best to have a few minutes at the end for questions. So if you want to start thinking about them, then we will give you an opportunity to ask those at the end. In the meantime, though, I would like to structure the conversation for the next 40 minutes or so in two parts. The first part, I would like to tackle some of the challenges because being such of an innovative technologies or platform, depends how you want to call it, there are certain challenges that need to be overcome to make it material. And then I want to move it a little bit more on the side of the aspiration and the vision about what each of the organization here represented, what to achieve in the future. So by navigating at the edge of science and, uh, and with this ambition and vision of really changing the world, I wanted to start from something very practical that is around uh, some of the foundational compliant manufacturing. Because we have companies that often have a fast track that often have a process that very much looks into the biolo biology and the fundamental mechanism of action. But doing manufacturing and manufacturing at scale, it's a different ballpark game. There is an element of putting in place manufacturing elements that are GMPable, that are compliant to FDA regulatory expectation. For instance, the compliance of sourcing the, the PSCs all the ethical forms and all the appropriateness on how we create the cell line and we do manufacture this cell line are far from being obvious. And the last thing the company wants is that they run all the way fast to a phase two, wonderful data, and then either they hit a wall in phase three commercialization or they have to go back and restart with a proper compliant process. Maybe on this topic, Melissa, if you don't mind, why don't you give your perspective? Oh, sure. And, and this is something that we talk about a lot. Um, how do you enable technologies to get after th up to phase one? And then what do you do with when you're successful? And how do you move forward to commercialization? So as you were just suggesting, the, the way that, and I speak um, in the US regulations, because that's <coughs> where I live, and, and that's my sweet spot. But in the US, if you, if you want to get into a phase one trial, there's phase appropriate GMP is what we call this. And that's good for, for folks that are trying to get into a clinical trial. And that means that not everything has to be GMP right out of the gate. So you might have some research reagents, you might have closed, you might not have the closed systems yet, and you can go forward as long as you 
can demonstrate safety and efficacy into a clinical trial. But let's just say then that you've got a phase one, two, some data that shows that there might be some efficacy here. So, and that's a good thing. So you go and you get an accelerated designation. And let's say you get an RMAT designation. And that's great. So then the next thing you want to do is move as quickly as possible to a pivotal trial. But you're with a research process that has, or a, a manufacturing process that is not completely GMP. And you don't want to start your pivotal trial unless your manufacturing is going to take you through that pivotal trial and be suitable for registration and commercialization. So you're in a place where you need to solve for your manufacturing before you have clinical proof of concept. And this is something that a lot of uh, researchers and uh, companies are struggling <coughs> with, and there isn't an obvious solution other than to be able to increase your manufacturing capacity earlier if you can. And that's something that, that we do at Elevate. That's the infrastructure that we talk about, where we've got all of this infrastructure to enable multiple technologies and build in efficiencies. So it's, but it is an enormous challenge, I think, for the field. Thank you much. Lalo, maybe your perspective. How are your, is your organization ensuring compliance manufacturing at scale? How do you tackle the problem? Yeah, so look, so our strategy is, um, is to go um, pursue, um, you know, a process to, that allows to go fast to the clinic, mm -hmm. you know, and as I was saying earlier, build the expertise right up front um, so that you have really uh, detailed understanding of your product, right? That's critical. That's why you need to invest in, 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 um, um, in all the analytical, the process development, so you really have a good understanding of your process. And, um, and, and that means that you need to be prepared to uh, incorporate process changes down the road, right? Um, so that is our strategy, right? Go fast, fast to the clinic. We have obviously um, a, a process that is suitable for clinical, um, you know, manufacturing of uh, supplies for supporting clinical studies, phase two. We invested on a manufacturing facility so we can, um, as soon as you have pivotal data, you have a go to a pivotal study, right? You can start investing on the next phase, you know, expand your manufacturing. And, and if there are changes, scale up, for example, right? Um, if you scale up and, and, and your changes and your, uh, you know, in that process results in, in that the, the characteristics of your product don't change dramatically, that, that you have minimal, you know, you, you should not even need a bridge study, for example. Now, if you incorporate other processes where you do change the characteristics of, of your product, then you may need, you know, of course, a bridge study at some point. But that, in our case, you know, we're working in, in uh, oncology, and, and so you have big effect sizes. You know, probably you don't need large studies for, for doing that. So that's that's what we're thinking about. In, in summary, it's go go fast early. You know, it's understood that you at some point will incorporate process changes, right? And you need to have the, the team and the understanding to to do that effectively. So thank you very much. So fast, and then course correct if needed. Maybe also and tweak. In, in and true. tweak. It's tweak as needed, right? And it as you need, right? <laughs> Thank you much. Seth, yeah. instead from the Blue Rock perspective, how, what is your strategy to make sure that when you are commercializing the product, you are ready from a compliance or manufacturing? So I echo a little bit of what just was said, and we too in Blue Rock struggle with the um, idea of it's really important to get into the clinic and fail quickly if you can and not uh, perfect it so much that you never find out the question. So we struggle with the how much uh, of the detail, the characterization, and the analytics to really get control of and a hold on in that very first study. But as Melissa then said, it's the moment right after that first study's batch that uh, all of that becomes true. And there are lessons that we can learn from the oncology space and cell therapy that's already been had. Lalo made a mention around effect size. Um, and for us, there's still an incredible need for a dialogue with the regulators. We are educating them at the same time that they are helping guide us into being a group doing this safely. Um, and so I think if you watch those dialogues, we saw that, and in gene therapy as well, there's lessons that we should pay attention to. The, the first one around cell therapy is don't overpromise on the analytics. We've <laughs> seen companies overpromise on the analytics because they're basing their ideas around uh, the quality by design that happened in biologics, as you mentioned early. That's really hard to apply. Small scale and quality by design in a therapeutic that's a living cell, gets, it's, it's, not, it's not a cut and paste. And so that was a lesson that the industry had to learn. 
Um, but the regulators were really flexible with the, with the oncology products as they came forward in terms of potency assays and characteristics that got defined and are continuing to get defined later. Yeah. But we're seeing the opposite in gene therapy, yeah? Where we've seen now gene therapies come on market and get stopped because of CMC quality issues and or um, an inability to control the product uh, as well. And so I think these two lessons are cornerstones for us to take in, um, building out the analytics, building out the characterization, having a really uh, important understanding of the quality of the product that you're bringing forward and being able to reproduce that. That is the beauty of the iPSC cell, is that being not having a batch-to-batch -batch variability by the patient gives you much more control and tighter control of that, at least a, a semblance of control. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So it's not that you can be on top of everything at the beginning, and so you need to not corner yourself with characterization and assay, release assay that would put you in a non-releasable corner, but over time narrowing the specification so that you can follow the journey, if I understand. Because your, your patient population risk benefit and the uh, data that comes out of your efficacy and safety are also going to guide those characteristics. So if you do them in the absence of that, you do, you're imagining what it has to be versus as you do it with knowing some of those things. Um, Being you can, guided. You can be appropriate same. at the time frame appropriate. Super. So, Kui, do you want to add something on the matter? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, a lot of lesson learned and the experience that are already elaborated. Um, I'd just like to add a little bit of what Melissa just highlighted, right? At the, um, the beginning of you know, the inception of the company, we decided to build the in-house manufacturing to keep the you know, technology, the manufacturing technology, very close to where the science and the research activities are, where the data is. So since then, I think Aspen has taken a really, um, really smart and very flexible approach, which, which is to build uh, the, the phase of property manufacturing capacity. So that we'll be able to die up and die down as needed. You know, a lot of changes will happen. Optimizations make the process more, more robust, modular close or open, right? A lot of things that we need to change it based on the, the product knowledge and based on what efficacy that we, we learn and that we desire uh, for the product to do. So that really requires your know, constant kind of mindset changing. And also you know, the, the opportunities here you know, to be with CDMO and then the other tech technology developers that would also inspire a lot of tricks that Lila B, you mentioned. So, so that is something that we feel could really help with the pace of the development. Very good. No, thank you much. And if you don't mind, I stay with you with the next question. <laughs> and uh, I, I kind of give the umbrella of safety, but in reality, it's going to be very scientific as intended as a question. So if you think about safety, there are elements like genomic integrity. There is elements related to the actual characterization of what we are defining as a product. And then the aspect of really delivering only differentiated cells. So all those things are element that comes into the general consideration of safety, but are very scientific. Would you like to comment on some of those three that I mentioned? So genomic integrity, actual characterization, and delivery of differentiated cells? Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. Um, so you know, kind of looking at this, the area, we are really standing on the shoulders of giants in the field. So probably we'll um, kind of just take a step back like two decades ago, right? Then you know, when Gene you know, started and the other collaborators uh, globally look at embryonic stem cells through you know, the, the cultivation. And what they found was actually quite um, astonishing because the genetic alterations are actually quite frequent, right? That you call the cells the same name, but really the functionality, the characteristics, the identity of the cells could vary from passage to passage and lab to lab. And then, you know, based on that finding, she actually established a very, very robust panel of the genome-based characterization assays and anything from the whole genome so sequencing, single nu nucleotide polymorphism sequencing, RNA-seq. So started from there, the Aspen actually has incorporated many of the such uh, genomics-based tools into um, our analytics. And it's not just the beginning or any part of the process, it's actually throughout the entire process. We interrogate the cells in utilizing very robust analytics. 
and then you know, really understand, right? You, the, the cells need to be free of those tumor driver genes, mutations. Uh, need, they need to be freed of any type that potential detrimental genomic um, alterations. And also um, the chain of the custody of the, the material, right, from the beginning to the end. Um, and also the characteristics, the, the, the critical quality attributes that desired for the intermediates and also for the products. So, you know, in order to, to really have a full understanding of those characteristics and not only those genome-based tools, and also some of the machine learning algorithms can help us to characterize it. I interrupt it. you because I see Lalo wants to jump in, so. Yeah, I saw. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I'll be happy, yeah. I will, uh, look, for us, one thing that I was saying earlier, the, the, what is really powerful about this platform is that enable us to incorporate multiple genetic modifications. So, we, we just got an IND, um, a safe to proceed for with our first IND where we have six different genetics were incorporated with in three sequential HDR steps where we knock out a gene and we incorporate a transgene FSI loci. And we did this three times. Um, of course, uh, and so, so many people were really concerned, well, you know, how much can you put gene editing and so on. Well, our next generation products will have 12 different genetics in five different sequential steps. And we're absolutely confident that this is, this is not a problem. You can do it. And what is the, 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 the secret? Well, you need to, I mean, we all know, and the, you know, what motivated your question is that nucleases, especially if you have double strand breaks as part of your modification, will incorporate some small frequency, uh, a, a small, with a small um, uh, frequency, uh, um, some, some changes, uh, you know, incorporate new variants. And so what you need to do to, to go about this is to have a really a, is a precise understanding of the genetic characteristics of your product, starting with the original donor, the, your PSC line, before any modification, and then finally your master cell bank with all the modifications, and then finally your drug product, right, that you manufacture from the master cell bank. So what you need to do is to characterize using, you know, orthogonal assays um, and to uh, understand if you incorporate the variants or not, as you were saying, you know, there are well, you know, a, a clear path to understand if there are variants of risk or not. Uh, one advantage that we have with the IPSC platform um, that uh, allow us to do that is that we have the, the luxury that we can screen hundreds or even thousands of individual clones and allow us to identify those that have um, the right genomic characteristics. They don't have unwanted variants, right? And so. It's doable, so you need to have orthogonal approaches to understand and characterize, you know, your clones, and and um, and that's it, right? Thank and, you. And so I know doable. that Melissa is also passionate right, on the right. topic, so I yeah, want yeah. to give her a chance. And I also know that for you is critically important the sourcing of the yeah. of the material, yeah. the ethical aspect of that, and the compliant aspect of that. Oh, sure, sure. So I, and I agree that with the the concept that you need to assess yourselves, and we assess ourselves as well. We look at our cell lines, we look at, we sequence them, do exome sequencing. We actually also look at the imprinting status of the cells and make sure that the, the integrity of that is, is still intact. But when you think about, I mean, the starting material that you're using, whether it's uh, the iPSCs that you, the cell, the starting material that you generate your iPSCs from, of course, is another issue that you need to think about in terms of compliance with regulations. But when you think about the stability of the cells and we look at, at sequencing and, and as our tools have gotten better, we look more granularly. But we're still at the place where we're not quite sure what to do with the data. It's, you're going to see mutations. Are the mutations problematic? And you know, there's some obvious things, like you don't want a P53 mutation. Uh, that's just a sort of common sense thing. But you're going to see an accumulation of mutations and, and we don't know how to deal with that yet, so we functionally test. We still do tumor genicity studies. And because it really boils down to after you've taken your IPSC or your ESC, you've differentiated it to the final product. Is that final product safe and effective? And we can do all of the work, and we should do all of the work on the IPSCs, but I think we also need to pay a lot of attention to the final product. Understood. Seth, you want to comment anything on this topic, or shall we do to access no, I, education? I, I, I think I actually want to be a little controversial for our panel. Um, as we were talking earlier in our pre-meeting as well, 
which would be to say, and, and I think I erred on this in the last comment, um, because you can doesn't mean you should. Meaning, we have tools to get down to the nucleotide level, uh, and as you just mentioned, the epigenetic level. Um, we're dealing with source material from humans that are still alive, in some cases, um, and you owe that information to those individuals if you find something, and you owe it to regulators if you find something. Um, we're, we're certainly not intending to be genetic counselors because we don't even know what some of the findings that, as Melissa just said, we don't know what some of these SNPs mean. Um, we need to make sure that we're rigorous in the quality and the testing of the end product. Um, I would caution us all to sequence every clone that we get and then uh, give that information out into the world in the instability. The, that is in the literature, we're all seeing it, we need to pay attention to various genes. Um, but I do, I would err us on caution of, of over-promising an understanding that doesn't exist in the scientific literature yet. Um, and if you take out six cells from our body, I would guarantee you, you're going to find quite a few mutations in those cells. <laughs> Good. Changing completely in pace, but staying with you, Seth, if you don't mind. Related to access and education, um, there are aspects related to ethical, aspect pricing, access questions, and in any way, Beside the science, we have an obligation also of education and preparing, call it the market or the people or the regulators or the world out there to what's coming. How would you tackle this? What's your frame? Yeah, it's a, it's, that's a pretty broad question. I, I, it's something that we're thinking a lot about at Blue Rock um, as we move into Parkinson's disease. Um, unlike some of our other gene therapy brethren or even cell therapy brethren in, in NHL, this is a large patient population. It affects tens, you know, eight million people around the world. Um, and so there's a, there's a need for both a stepwise education for what are we doing, what do we understand, what do we not understand about the therapeutic, and also even the delivery. You touch on the piece of access, which I think is front and center to our mind. Um, when you think about a very small, rare disease, uh, getting that patient population informed is somewhat easier. But now when you talk about a really broad-based disease, degenerative neurological disease that is a quality of life issue. Um, they're, they're, we owe that patient population uh, the best we can to prepare ourselves for such a drug to come onto the market because it's so different <coughs> from what not just payers but what patients have been used to in their relationship with their doctor. Um, and so, I, so we, we, this is a, a, a constant part of our journey. It goes right along the drug development. We can't just pay attention to just simply collecting the efficacy and the safety data being done. So that of, do you expect the resistance or any, any key point where we need to push for one agenda on access or pricing or education? I mean, look, I, the, the, the pricing question is a very complex one, right? Um, and so um, I think the, these modalities are not exception to any of the other ones, right? Where we have the same challenges. I mean, our, our mission as a company was from the beginning is to um, develop therapies that could um, expand uh, patient access in many different ways. It's not just, you know, what goes into the, the price of that therapy, and um, it is one dimension, but um, there are others, right? And, and so, but you're asking specifically about the, the, the pricing piece? No, mostly access, I would say. Kind of making sure that, so the way that we can think is that those are living cells, it's also technology that's pretty innovative that comes with a lot of loaded questions from the safety, from the sourcing, and from kind of treating the patients, no? So in a way, there is the need of a preparation, both of the patient population to be willing to receive it, and from regulators to be willing to approve it, and prescriber to be willing to prescribe it, no? And uh, I'm sure that you as a company are thinking about how you how is the best way to go about uh, facilitating this journey to provide access to, to, to your drugs in the future? Well, look, we, we work on the oncology, right? So um, one, um, one key benefit of allogeneic approaches is that you want to have drugs that are um, available on demand at any hospital or clinic. The first, all, all, we all are familiar with the first <coughs> wave of autologous therapies so that you have, they're very complex. Uh, the manufacturing is very complex. You know, they are delivered primarily on an academic hospital, major centers, right, that they're not in rural areas. And, you know, so that's what really limits access from, from just that perspective. So simplifying the, the whole uh, process um, and making them available on demand, that's a major part of increasing access, right? But um, 
So that, that's the part that we're focusing on, executing on that vision, making sure that we can have drugs you know, that are, are, are safe and efficacious and deliver real value to patients and society. Sure. And, and the pricing is, a, is another topic, right, that is okay. much more uh, complex. And I, I would just say, people always worry about cost of goods, and, and I agree with your opening remarks, is that w the real aspiration here is that the cost of goods per dose or per regimen, it would be similar on par um, with, with that of thera uh, therapeutic antibodies, you know, down the road. So it's, you know, I don't think that the cost of goods is gonna be an issue for, for this um, industry. Super. Uh, Melissa, any comment on access or? You know, my only comment would really be um, to echo the things that Peter Mark said yesterday about having convergence of the regulatory mm -hmm. communities and the different jurisdictions to allow the, the drugs that we develop in one country or one jurisdiction to be used all over the world. And that there's a real need for that kind of convergence of the regulatory guidances. So. Very good point. So, Kui, yeah, I just wanted to add thing very quickly. So, um, you know, in addition to all the comments that, um, so we feel at the Aspen, it's very, very important to understand patient needs, like what Aaron just shared with us, right? Very inspiring in the strength and at the same time the pain um, and, and how to actually translate the patient needs into the product development, understand the product, you know, safety absolutely is the ultimate the first thing to focus and then when we when it comes to the activities so what are the what are the primary outcome what are the, the other things that the patient and their care keepers and the society actually to need to really improve the quality of the life it's a very important and also the ones who are ready to come up with something that we can communicate with patient the, the advocate group and and actually bring the um, the payers actually earlier to the table to kind of engage them to have that converse, conversation, have the education as early as possible, understand the market, and understand the, the, the landscape, do the homework early. And we felt, you know, because the company as things actually funded by patient, so they taught us a lot. Thank you much. Um, Lalo said, I also remember that you were making a very strong point around the funding and capital constraint about being sure that you as an organization put the money where it really matters. And with all the trade-off related to optimal strategy of use of funds, this is a general problem of the industry, especially mm -hmm. in the current market capital situation. But what's your spin specifically on IPSC company? Yeah, um, yeah, that's a really broad question. I think, <laughs> I'm not, you know, it's all companies that have to make a lot of decisions as to how you stage, how you grow a company, right? You have to, um, uh, in our case, as I was saying earlier, we, we made the decision that we wanted to have a vertically integrated company. We decided early on to invest at risk in manufacturing because we're pioneering a, a new class of therapies. Um, and so we need to capture all of that knowledge uh, in-house. We have a terrific partner uh, on, on FCDI, by the way, and so it's just to complement those efforts. Um, we, we recognize that in addition to having a, a, a CDMO partner, we need to have our own so we can develop our own expertise and institutional knowledge. So that is something that our investors understood the vision, and as I was saying earlier, uh, and to invest and create in the critical mass so you have expertise in all the key areas. In our case, cellular engineering is, is, is critical to our vision on how to move the field forward, right? That, um, and so we need to invest on that. Um, that means all the science, immunology, systems of biology, protein engineering, and then in the manufacturing side and all elements of manufacturing, right? You know, from, as I was saying earlier. So our investors in general, because this is such a new area, new modalities, IPSC derived immune effector cells in our case, um, is that it, it was it make a good uh, sense, right, to, to build all those capabilities uh, in house. So, and of course, as the co company, you know, companies um, evolve. We always are very thoughtful about how to scale the growth of the company. Thank you, Seth. What would be your strategy or recommendation to the audience? Yeah, I, I, I guess I'd start with a quote from one of our, our original um, CEO, Emil Nueser, who's uh, here, arm uh, president as well. And he used to show us all every cell type or every genotype. We have editing capability and we have differentiation capability. 
And while that's a, it's a beautiful vision, it's, and it's what Blue Rock was founded on, um, there are choices to be made in there. Um, and with success uh, in our first clinical trials comes even more choices. Our largest group, our largest endeavor, as Laura, Laura was just saying, is our tech, technical operations group. Um, it, we started off with a very large research group and we're headed towards an, ex, an immense uh, manufacturing and uh, tech ops group for process development, MSAT, all the way through to commercial. Um, the benefit of being with Bayer has been that they've made an investment in building infrastructure and people for commercial manufacturing, even from the get-go of our phase one. And that's been an essential piece because each of the handoffs, we talked about comparability, but each of these handoffs to each group becomes a, a, a a very important inflection point for the process, for the drug development. Um, and so we have to be thoughtful and careful and spend quite a bit of time there. Uh, and so I, I echo that we have to make some really critical choices. Um, and uh, there we're guided by where can we do the most patient impact in the speediest manner. Um, and that's sort of what brings us to several of the product choices that we've made. Thank you much. Any desire to top up comments, Melissa? Or? Oh. Well, I, I would just add one thing about the Elevate structure, which is similar to what we've heard. There's efficiencies built in by having a pipeline of activities. But in the Elevate ecosystem, we also have um, our manufacturing facilities actually revenue generating. So that does help with some of the, how we view the amount of, of different therapeutics we can go forward with. But I think because of the expense of all the things we're talking about, being in a situation where you've got actual revenue coming in through your, your manufacturing facility makes a whole lot of sense. So. I hear you. Any, any aspect on this side that we should well, ask you? It's just, you know, as a scientist, right, seeing the downturn, right, of the market is kind of, you know, it, it's challenging, but also I feel it's kind of a, like a motivation for company like us to remain really laser focused mm -hmm. on the key areas, right, for the, First, we need to you know, take this as an opportunity to demonstrate the proof of concept. You know, we can do it you know, in the autologous therapy world, join the forces, and you know, how do we tackle some of the technical challenges in order to provide a, affordable therapy? And technology-wise, how do we actually align that you know, in the different sections right, to help us to be there you know, once we can demonstrate the cells are safe and the efficacious? So, um, you know, the other area is actually how do we, how do we think about the pass forward, you know, that to, to really, the, to be able to treat all the patients always the need. So. Very good. Then I stay with you. Uh, one of the classical things that jumps at the eye when someone looks at the IP and the freedom to operate landscape is that it's pretty complex. Many organizations has different interwinding uh, IPs and, uh, and limitations. How do you navigate that effectively? You want me to yeah. start? If you want. So, you know, we're early in this, right? And then you will learn from, you know, a lot of folks, this is actually going to, t it's a long journey for us together, which, again, provide the opportunity, right, for the industry actually really come together to figure this out. So, I mean, our philosophy is that we're all in this together. So, one success, right, from one company, one therapy, as we have seen from these conferences, from gene therapies, is actually going to influence the industry significantly. So that's why the early discussions, alliance, strategic collaborations and partnerships are very important. And also the innovations that, that we actually continuously can build the IPs and in order to, to basically help the industry to work together at the end of the day, so all the patients are waiting, right? That we, we, we are obligated, we have the obligation to bring the, the innovative therapy to them. So to me, it's a collaboration partnership and they really work together to figure a lot of this ins and outs that out. Very good. If anyone wants to comment further on this topic, you're very welcome. If not, we look forward to vision of each of your organization. Maybe uh, with you, Seth, one of the observations I have is that even in the IPC, there has been a quite meaningful switch toward immune oncology or in kind of, okay, let's call it immune oncology in general, but still the regenerative aspect is uh, important. I understand that you have a particular focus on the regenerative aspect. Can you elaborate a little bit more why this is important, what's the vision of your company, and just give us an aspiration forward on the matter? Yeah, sure. Um, 
So I, 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 Blue Rock has been founded and continues to be focused on a regenerative aspect of fi uh, find disease indications where the cell type is lost to the disease or to aging, and it's a then find and replace function for us. Replace with the uh, most characterized, best identity that you can of that exact cell and recapture its function, and thereby get rid of the pathology of the disease for the patient or regain uh, function. And so that's kind of where we hover. We look for a connection to cell and disease, and then we look to, if, do we understand that cell? Can we characterize it? And is there a differentiation process for it? Um, I do think, and Lalo mentioned this earlier, there is, because of the oncology clinic, there is such desperate need in the patient population and there's a high <coughs> risk reward benefit. You can test new modalities there quite, sim quite easily, uh, but it leaves off many diseases that are underserved in, in uh, the, our ability to understand the cell and the cell type. And so there are, we are not standing alone. There are many companies that are going after uh, ophthalmology and uh, we've seen lots of companies in diabetes for islet cells that are going to be incredibly well served outside of the oncology clinic. Um, of course, there is still need in oncology and, and, and we're not leaving that alone. We, we do have oncology aspirations and, and product projects as well. Um, but, but our focus has been really a find and replace sort of strategy. Okay. Thank you very much. Xiao Queen, in your case, autologous, IPSC from autologous, autologous IPSC, it's also kind of an unusual choice. Do you mind to elaborate why this could be particularly important or what's the vision here? Yeah, the vision here is that autologous, we believe that is ultimately the personalized medicine for every patient. So utilizing this, then you will be able to eliminate, it, for example, immune suppression, which it, it could be really challenging for the patients with chronic conditions, right? And then also, um, you know, the, for the elderly patient population. So, and we, because the, the AI focus, the genomics, and also the machine learning algorithm that help us to understand, you know, the identity and the functionality of the cells, we believe that we actually can produce the cells, not only the safety, and also with the function that's pertinent to that individual. In a very, you know, it's, it's end to end, right? It, it's, we can do it, it's feasible. And then in the future, you know, we can demonstrate in the, in, in the manufacturing setting how yeah. those type of the analytics can help us to really reduce the cost and the time. So then, you know, the, it's a safety efficacy. It's a, it's a truly personalized medicine. Thank you very much. Melissa, okay. you are instead one of the biggest advocates of the platform as a whole, dedicating <laughs> all your life to it. So where this uh, can take us? What's, uh, what's the oh. broader picture here? Sure. So, I mean, we've spent a whole lot of time talking about challenges. That's what we always focus on. Oh, it's going to be so hard. It's going to be so risky. But one of the things I like to do is look back and say, you know, gee, we've come so far from cells that were grown in serum on feeders and you had to pass it with a pipetman. But, but now, as we look forward, we've been able to solve for cell numbers such that we can now even get into immuno-oncology where we can have enough cells. We don't have to stay in the eye or the brain or immunoprivileged sites um, to deliver allogeneic therapies. And we are able to scale. And in fact, we have just launched our own iPSC-derived uh, immuno-oncology uh, company with technology out of George Daly's lab at the BCH. But as we look forward, what, we, what I see is we need to get the people out of the GMP suite, right? We need to automate, we need to just, th this is very labor intensive and very artful. And it's, I think if we're going to be successful to, to deliver to patients, to not just a couple of patients or a handful of patients, but to be able to actually do this at scale and to do it rapidly is, I think, going to be the next challenge. And automation, machine learning, these sorts of things are what we're starting to develop at Elevate as well. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Lalo, what's going to be the bright future and when we are going to see the first commercial product? <laughs> and well, that's, <laughs> we don't have a crystal ball, but hopefully soon enough in the, you know, in, uh, in the, uh, you mean IPSC derived uh, for immune oncology? I can comment. I, I follow that field. Mm -hmm. I don't follow the regenerative uh, field as closely, so I cannot comment on that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, well, we are. We have. There are, there are two companies. Uh, there, you know, 
the, in our space, leading, leading the way, and it's hard to say, but I would say in the, in the late 20s, mid 25 and 27, 28. It's not that far away. No, no. I mean, that's what we're, we're how to aim high. I, I want to make one comment that I think may be of interest to the audience, all, all of you that may um, be involved in allogeneic cell therapy development, regardless if it's for you know, regenerative medicine or immune oncology, like in our case. Something that we don't talk a lot about, and that's, it is the issue of uh, rejection, right? You know, allogeneic therapies, by definition, are foreign to the, to the, to the recipient. And so um, a key part of our vision to uh, enhance the field in immune oncology uh, to go beyond what autologous have been able to deliver from a, in, in terms of the proportion of patients that achieve a, a durable response you know, there is in the, in the lymphoma space around, you know, 40%. To really go beyond that, we, we will have to realize the, the therapeutic value of repeat dosing regimens, right? That's where allogeneic can, can come into play. But to do that, you need to solve the rejection problem, right? Because the first dose sensitizes the subject. Subsequent doses are, you know, boost, you know, the sensitivity, the immunogenicity. And so that's why, again, the gene editing is so important to really incorporate the edits that render your cells, you know, invisible to the immune system. And, and so uh, that's one of the hurdles. Um, you know, so in answering your question, you know, we're working, of course, to tackle that head on um, with all of our products. But we're going to learn, uh, right, um, uh, from data in the clinic how we can really overcome some of those biology challenges. Um, but I'm really confident that we are going to get through and that they're going to, you know, allogeneic cell therapies uh, in, in immune oncology will be in the market, you know, in the next few years. Very but good. there are challenges, a lot of learnings, right, uh, you know, ahead of us. Super. We have a few minutes that we can open for questioning the audience. We have one question here, yeah. but I a, mic, a mic is coming. Yes. It's a kind of a beautiful cube of blue color. Oh, yeah, this thing really scares me, I have to say. So I wanted to make two points, if you'll just allow me. Um, I'm Jean Loring, and so I was mentioned because I founded Aspen. And I wanted to ask the panel, how many of you have had your whole genome sequence? You want to raise your hand? How scary was it? Not Sounds at scary. all. So I've had my whole genome sequence six times. It always comes out a little bit different because it, my blood, you know, they're sequencing my blood and the population is a little different. I've also had my iPS cells sequenced. Mm -hmm. They're a little different from my blood. But in fact, what it's, what it's ta taught me is that there is a wide range of normal. Exactly. And since I've survived all these years, I know that my genome has not, is not out to get me. Right. So everything that I, I find from my own genome sequence and the sequence of other healthy people is normal. And so I can eliminate a lot of the stuff right. that you're worried about right. because those variations don't matter. That, well, we share that perspective. That's why we don't share that, that the fear of, uh, that has been put forward by some. Because biology is variability, right? It's yeah. a lot of variability. And so, so we call them variants, right? They're not mutations, they're but variants. But that's actually why we survive. That's right. And so we have a lot of variability within our own bodies. <laughs> yeah, we have to accept so. it. I have one more, if you don't mind. I wanted to bring up hypoimmunity because you did. Um, I think for um, cancer treatment, that makes a lot of sense because the cells don't engraft. So that means they won't re be rejected as they're they're acting as they're supposed to. But if you're doing a durable therapy like for Parkinson's disease in which the cells may be in somebody's brain or for heart disease in which the cells will be in somebody's heart for the rest of their lives, which is maybe 30 years, you, you really do have dangers of hypoimmunity that, that raise that issue. So what I'm saying is that certain things are appropriate for certain diseases and not for others. And I think we all need to keep that in mind because there's not mm -hmm. just one answer. Well, are, you, are you implying that, that, that um, rejection or high immunity is not important in some? Oh, no, I'm telling you, oh, it's very important oh, for, you, oh. for you because the cells aren't yeah. grafting. Uh, they, they, they do. They have, they have shown cells in I cancer know, patients for decades I know, after I know, infusion. I, so I know, I follow no, that. But, <laughs> but it's not going, no. And, and, and there have also been cancers <laughs> that have shown up after decades, too, from the cells that were, had integrated transgenes. So yes, occasionally they do integrate, but that's not the point. The point is to get rid of the cancer. So you, your cells will not have to live in the body for very long. 
So I think that the, uh, in your case, using hypoimmune cells makes a great deal of sense because it's a very small risk that they will engraft and then perhaps cause problems in 20 years. I think it's less of a risk than it is using transgenes, uh, CAR-T therapies, because we already, we already know that those things can awaken uh, much later in life. So I'm pro, but with, a, um, you know, with, with those um, sorts of concerns. Thank you. Anyone else that wants the blue cube? Down there. Behind you, there is a person that wants to ask a question. No? No, I made a mistake. Any further question in the room? It's hard for me to see. Down there. I thank you, Ian Gaudet, Milton Biotech. What can tools providers do now to help build the capabilities that are going to be necessary to bring more of these to the clinic and commercialize these? Very clear question. Yeah, David. Hey, and good to see you. Um, uh, I, I think, uh, as you know, uh, flexibility, especially now in our field, with some of the applications and the devices that come forward <coughs> by the size of the cell culture devices, um, and then the ability to break apart the unit operations a little bit. I would say that those are things that Melissa talked about getting the humans out of the room. Um, in order to do that, we're going to have to break it apart a little bit. Um, and that is where many of us are going. Many of us are each of the places where we're having some obstacles, we're uh, putting in some automation into that space, but uh, not so much closed in end to end. Yeah. And I would add around the automation piece of it, not only automation for actual manufacturing, but automation for the analytics. So when you're talking about thousands of clones line, yeah. and how it is that you're going to do all of that assessment, you're going to need ultimately automation for that as well. So. Thank you. Thank you. Any last question or last two questions on Max? One here, please. Uh, thank you. It's, I've got a question for Seth, if that's okay. You mentioned about um, not overdoing the analytics sometimes. And just because you can doesn't mean that you should. How do you make a judgment call on, on how far to go with the uh, characterization? Yeah, I, I guess, and to Lori's earlier comment, um, we have learned this lesson. I have lived learning this lesson. And the, the important part is understanding critical quality attributes as best you can, follow the critical quality attributes, and also to then understand safety aspects. Um, this, it's a living drug. It is not a biologic. And we will not be able to corner every piece of every characteristic and then guarantee it to the regulators. And so I don't, I don't think that's a fear-based from my standpoint. It's more of a understand what you know and, and be able to deliver on that. I have watched companies and been inside companies that weren't able to deliver on that, and it's incredibly impactful to patients. It's, it's very scientifically interesting, but incredibly impactful to patients when you approach that from only a science basis instead of a how do I make sure my patient gets something safe and effective. All right. Anyone else? Down there. As the block goes, uh, goes to the lady, I might want to comment also on this one. As a manufacturer that has been exposed to many companies that want to go to the journey of commercial, often happens that uh, these parameters for release gets fixed without a real rationale linked to efficacy or safety. And they are more defined on an abstract criteria of narrowness and specificity. And what this is causing, and I don't want to say the notable example because it might be inappropriate, that you are actually not able to release the drug, but this drug is perfectly efficacious and safe, and you find yourself to do a bunch of compassionate uses, releases, and actually go into patient, treat the disease, cure the patients, but on, on a strict compliance quality standpoint, you are doing something wrong. And uh, because it's also a business, you don't get paid for it. And so this simply becomes non-viable. So on one side, I'm all in favor of um, thorough characterization. And the requirement from the regulator is going to be tighter and tighter. But uh, I would not set top-down, ungrounded, 
narrow parameters based on QC assays that you don't have a full understanding how they correlate to either safety or performance because you can corner yourself into having to trash a drug that in reality could be very efficacious. This is through across the board. But I very much agree with you. Sorry, question and then we close. He has a client, CEO and co-founder at Selino, and I love everybody on the stage. It's really nice to see all of you. I wanted to ask a question more in the direction of machine learning because so many of us are now incorporating that into the analytics, into the machine learning, into the um, manufacturing piece, and would just love your thoughts on how we should think about it from a regulatory standpoint because it doesn't seem trivial to me. <laughs> You know, I, I would give just one example around that. Um, Kapil Bharti at the NEI has a trial with um, IPSC RPE for AMD, I believe. And he's using a machine learning algorithm, I believe, for his release testing, um, for his product release, which demonstrates that you're, he was able to qualify the assay. And I'm not quite sure how he did it, but it tells me that it's feasible. And I view that as a very encouraging piece to be able to, again, get the, get the person out of the, the assessment, so. Yeah. It's an autologous program and right. mm -hmm. the machine learning based analysis was yeah. super helpful to get mm -hmm. reproducible data yeah. and it's a combination of imaging and analytics, so yeah. thank you. Thank you. I'm receiving very fearful gesture from the back of the room, so I suppose I need to give a quit to the conversation. I want okay. to thank you, the panelists. I want to thank you all for your attention, and hopefully this was interesting. Thank you very much.